You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Soul Economy and Waldorf Education, translated by Roland Everett. This is Lecture 2, given in Dornock on the 24th of December, 1921. The art of education, about which a great deal will be spoken during this course of lectures, is entirely based on a knowledge of man. A deeply founded knowledge of man, however, can only be attained if it is based upon a knowledge of the entire universe, because man, with all his inherent abilities and powers, is rooted in the universe. Therefore, a real knowledge of man can only spring from a knowledge of the world in its entirety. Conversely, one can say that the attitude and the ideas regarding education, characteristic of any age, also reflect the general world outlook of that particular age. In order to make a correct assessment of contemporary views on education, we therefore must examine these against the background of the general world conception of our present time. In this context, it is helpful to look at the ideas expressed by a personality who is a typical representative of the present-day worldview, as it gradually developed during the last few centuries. There is no doubt that since that time, mankind has been looking with great pride upon the achievements brought about through intellectuality, and this is still largely true today. Footnote, Rudolf Steiner here uses the German word Intellectualismus, translated as intellectuality. With this word he tried to indicate the parasitic nature of the kind of intellect which proliferates into intellectuality. A distinction must be made between the words intelligence, intellect, and intellectuality. Translator's note and a footnote. Fundamentally speaking, educated people of today have become very intellectualized, even if they will not admit to it. Everything in the world is judged through the instrument of the intellect. When we think of names which we associate with the first awakening of modern thinking, we are led to the founders of modern philosophy and of present-day attitudes to life, and these personalities have based all their work on their firm belief in man's intellectual powers. Names such as Galileo, Copernicus, Giordano Bruno come to mind, and they easily make one believe that their mode of thinking is relevant only to scientific matters, but this is not the case. If one observes without prejudice the outlook on life among the vast majority of people today, one will find a touch of natural scientific thinking hidden almost everywhere. And in this mode of thinking there lives intellectuality. One may be under the impression that in one's moral concepts or impulses and in one's religious ideas and experiences, one is free from such scientific thinking. But one will soon discover that by being exposed to all that flows through newspapers and popular magazines into the masses, one easily allows oneself to be influenced in one's conceptual life by a natural scientific undertone People who are unaware of the fact that today's citizen sits down at the breakfast table already filled with scientific concepts, that he takes these to bed when he goes to sleep at night, that he uses them in his daily work, and that he brings up his children with them, such people simply do not see life as it really is. They live under the illusion of being free from a scientific way of thinking. We even take our scientific concepts to church services, and though we may hear quite traditional views expressed from the pulpit, we, nevertheless, hear them with ears attuned to natural scientific ways of thinking, and natural science is fed by intellectuality. Science quite rightly stresses the fact that all its results are based upon outer observation, upon experimentation and its interpretation. But nevertheless, the instrument of the soul, which is used 
when such experiments are made in chemistry or physics, represents the most intellectual part of the human entity. Therefore the picture of the world, which man is making for himself, is nevertheless the result of his intellect. Educated people of the Western world have become quite enraptured by all the progress achieved through intellectuality, especially in our present time. This had led to the opinion that in earlier times mankind was more or less lacking in intelligence. Man of old is supposed to have lived with naive and childish ideas about the world, whereas now we believe we have reached an intelligent comprehension of the world. It is generally felt that the modern view of the world is the only one based on firm ground. People have become afraid of losing themselves in the world of fantasy as soon as they relinquish the same domain of the intellect. Anyone whose thinking follows along modern lines, lines which have been gradually developing during the last few centuries, is bound to come to the conclusion that a realistic conception of life depends on the use of the intellect. Now, something very remarkable can be observed. What, on the one hand, is considered to be the most valuable asset, the most important feature of our modern civilization, namely this intellectuality, has, on the other hand, become questionable with regard to the upbringing and education of children, especially among people who are seriously concerned with education. Although one can see that mankind has made tremendous strides forward through the development of intellectuality, when looking at contemporary education, one can also find that if children are being educated only intellectually, their inborn capacities and their human potentials become seriously impaired and wither away. In some quarters, this realization has brought about a longing to replace intellectuality by something else. One has appealed to children's feelings and instincts. In order to steer away from the intellect, one has appealed to their moral and religious impulses. But how can one really find the right approach? Surely only by a thorough knowledge of man, which in turn must be the result of a thorough knowledge of the world in its entirety. As already mentioned, Looking at a representative thinker of our times, one can find the present worldview reflected in educational trends. And if one considers all relevant features, Herbert Spencer could be chosen as one such representative thinker. Footnote Herbert Spencer, 1820 to 1903. The following remarks relate to his book titled Education, printed in 1861, end of footnote. I do not quote Herbert Spencer because I consider his educational ideas to be particularly valuable for contemporary education. I am well aware of how open these are to all kinds of objections, and of how, because of certain amateurish features, they would have to be greatly elaborated. On the other hand, Herbert Spencer, in all his conceptions and ideas, is firmly grounded in the kind of thinking and the general culture as it has developed during the last two centuries. Emerson wrote about personalities whom he considered to be representative of the development of mankind, personalities such as Swedenborg, Goethe, and Dante. Footnote, Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803 to 1882, see title Representative Men. End of footnote. But for modern ways of thinking and feeling, it is, above all, Herbert Spencer, who is a typical representative of our time. Although such a person's way of thinking may be tinged with national traits, according to whether he is French, Italian, or Russian, Herbert Spencer transcends such national influences. It is not the conclusions reached by him in his many books on most aspects of life which are of importance, but the way in which he reaches them. For his mode of thinking is representative to a high degree of the thinking of all educated people, a people who are influenced by a scientific outlook and who endeavor to live in accordance with it. Intellectualistic natural science is the very matrix of all he has to say. And what are his conclusions? 
Herbert Spencer, who naturally never loses sight of the theory that man has gradually evolved from lower forms of life and who then compares the human being with the animals, voices the following question. Are we educating our young in accordance with our scientific ways of thinking? And he answers this question in the negative. In his essay on education, he deals with some of the most important questions of the modern science of education, such as, what kind of knowledge is of the greatest value? He critically surveys intellectual, moral, and physical education. But the real core of all his considerations is something which could have been postulated only by a modern thinker. Namely, we educate our children so that they learn to put their physical faculties to full use in later life. We educate them in order to fit them into their professional lives. We educate them so that they may become good citizens. According to our conceptions, we may educate them to become moral or religious persons. But there is one thing for which we do not educate them at all, namely, to become educators themselves. This, according to Spencer, is what is missing in all our educational endeavors. He maintains that, fundamentally speaking, people are not educated to become educators or parents. Now, as a genuine natural scientific thinker, he goes on to say, just as the development of a living creature is complete only when it has acquired the capacity of procreating its own species, so should it be with perfect education. The educated person should be able to educate and guide growing children. Such a postulate aptly illustrates the way in which a modern person thinks. Looking at educational practice of today, what are Herbert Spencer's conclusions? Speaking metaphorically, he makes a somewhat drastic, but in my opinion a very appropriate, comparison. First, he characterizes the tremendous claims made for education today, including, among others, also those made by Pestalozzi. Then, instead of qualifying these principles as being good or acceptable, he asks how they are implemented in practice and what life is really like in schools. In this context, he uses his somewhat drastic picture, saying, Let us imagine that some five to six centuries hence, an archaeologist, digging up some archives, were to unearth a description of our present educational system. Studying these documents, he would hardly be able to believe that these were representative of the general practice of our time. For in them he would find that children were taught grammar in order to li live themselves into their language. Yet we know well enough that the kind of grammar children are taught is hardly conducive to their being able to express themselves livingly in later life. Such an imaginary archaeologist would also discover that a large proportion of pupils were being taught Latin and Greek, which in our time are dead languages. From this he would conclude that the people those documents he was studying had no literature of their own, or if at all that little benefit would be gained from studying it. In this way Spencer tries to show how inadequately our present curricula prepare pupils for their later lives, despite all the claims made to the contrary. Finally, he lets the archaeologist conclude that as the unearthed document could not be indicative of the general educational practice of their times, he must have come across a syllabus used in some monastic order. He continues, and this naturally represents his opinion, the fact that adults who have undergone such educational practice are not entirely alienated from society, behaving like monks, is due to the pressures and the cruel demands which life makes upon them. Nevertheless, so judges our imaginary archaeologist, when having to face life's challenges, the former pupils respond clumsily because they have been educated as monks who now need to get on in an entirely different milieu. These views expressed by a man of the world and not by someone engaged in practical teaching, in their own way characterize contemporary education. Now, it may be asked, what kind of value does a person put upon his life 
after having been immersed in a natural scientific, that is, in an intellectualistic attitude to the world. With the aid of natural laws, we are able to comprehend lifeless matter. This leads us to conclude that following the same methods, we shall also reach an understanding of living organisms. This is not the time to go into the details of such a problem, but one can say that at our present state of civilization we tend to use thoughts which allow us to grasp only what is dead and what consequently lies outside the human sphere. Through research in physics and chemistry we construct a whole system of concepts which we then apply to the entire universe, albeit only hypothetically. It is true that today there are are already quite a number of people who question the rightness of using laboratory results or information gained through telescope and microscope as a basis for a general picture of the world. However, the natural scientific explanation of the world was bound to come, and with it the ways in which it affects human feelings and emotions. And if one applies concepts which are the result of laboratory or observatory research to explain the origin and the future development of the earth, what happens then? One is driven to imagine the primeval nebula of the Kant-Laplace theory, or, as views have been modified since their time, something of a similar nature. But this notion of primeval nebula makes sense only if we apply to it the laws of aeromechanics. These laws, however, contain nothing pertaining to a soul or spiritual character. People who long for such a soul spiritual element therefore have to imagine all kinds of divine powers as existing side by side with the aero mechanical conception of the universe. And then, somehow, these spirit beings have to be skillfully blended into the picture of the nebula. Man, certainly in his soul and spiritual aspect, is not part of this picture. He has been excluded from such a world conception people who have grown accustomed to the idea that only intellect-based natural science can give concrete and satisfactory answers will find themselves in a quandary when looking for some kind of divine participation at the beginning of world existence. A hypothetical conception of the end of the world is bound to follow the laws of physics. In this context we encounter the so-called second fundamental law of thermodynamics, According to this theory, all living forces are mutually transformable. However, if they are transformed into heat, or vice versa, if heat is transformed into them, the outcome is always an excess of heat. The final result for all processes on earth would therefore be a complete transformation of all living forces into heat. This destruction through heat would produce a desert world, containing no other forces except differences of temperature. Such a theory conjures up a picture of a gigantic graveyard in which lie buried all man's achievements, all his intellectual, moral, and religious ideals and impulses. If we place the human being between a world beginning from which he has been excluded and a world end in which again he has no place, all human ideals and achievements become nothing but nebulous illusions. In this way, an intellectualistic, natural scientific philosophy reduces the reality of man's existence to a mere illusion. Such an interpretation may be dismissed simply as an hypothesis, yet even if people today do not recognize how scientific theories affect their attitudes toward life, the negative consequences are nevertheless a reality. But the majority of people are not prepared to face realities. Neither do such scientific theories remain the prerogative of an educated minority, for they reach the masses through magazines and popular literature, often in very subtle ways. And against the background of such a negative soul mood, we try to educate our children, True enough, we also give them religious content, but here, above all, we are faced with a cleavage. For if we introduce religious ideas alongside our scientific conception of life, which is bound to affect our attitude of soul, 
we enter the realm of untruth. And untruth extracts its toll not only in ways the intellect can perceive, for it is active through its own inner power. Untruth, even if it remains unrevealed, even if it remains in the realm of the unconscious, nevertheless assumes a destructive power over life. We enter the realm of untruth if we are not willing to search for clarity regarding our attitudes to life. This clarity will show us that with the prevailing contemporary ideas, we can only gain knowledge of a world in which there is no room for man. Let us examine a scientific discovery, which rightly fills us with pride. We follow the chain of evolution in the animal world from the simplest and most imperfect forms, via the more fully developed animals, right up to the coming of man, whom we consider to be the most highly developed being. Does this way of looking at evolution not imply that we consider man to be the most perfect animal? In this way, however, we do not concern ourselves with the true and real nature of man at all. By such a question, even if it remains an unconscious one, man's feeling for his essential humanity is diminished and set aside. Again, I wish to quote Herbert Spencer because his views on contemporary education are so characteristic, especially with regard to latest attempts at reform, at bringing education into line with present-day scientific thinking. These reforms, generally, are based on conceptions which are quite alien to the human spirit. And again, Herbert Spencer is a representative example for what we meet in practical life almost everywhere. Spencer maintains that we ought to do away with the usual kind of influence exerted by adults over children, by parents or teachers. According to him, we have inherited from earlier times the bad habit of becoming angry if a child has done any, something wrong. We punish the child. We make him aware of our displeasure. With other words, we react in a way which is not directly linked to what the child has done. The child may have left things strewn all over the room, and we, the educator, may become angry when seeing it. To put it drastically, we might even hit the child. Now, what is the causal link, and the scientific researcher always looks for causal links, between our hitting the child and his being untidy? There is none at all. Herbert Spencer therefore suggests that in order to educate rightly we should become, quote, missionaries of causal processes, close quote. For instance, if we see a boy playing with fire by burning little bits of paper in a flame, we should recognize that he does so out of an inborn curiosity. We should not be upset because he might burn himself or possibly even set fire to the whole house, but we ought to realize that he acts out of an instinct of curiosity. We should make it happen, with all due caution, of course, that he burns himself ever so little, but then, only then, will he experience the causal connection. Following such or similar methods, we should establish causal links. We should become missionaries of causal processes. Whenever you meet people who wish to reform education, you will hear the opinion expressed that this principle of causality is the only possible one any unbiased person will reply, as long as we consider the intellectualistic, natural scientific approach to be the only right one, this principle of causality also is the only right one. As long as we think along accepted scientific lines, there is no alternative in education. But where does all this lead to if we follow these methods to their extremes and if we are absolutely truthful? we completely fetter the human being with all his powers of thinking and feeling to the processes of nature. His thoughts and feelings then also become mere processes of nature, bereft of their own identity and mere products of an unconscious and unfree participation. If man is considered to be nothing more than a link in the chain of natural necessity, he cannot free himself from nature's bonds in any way. This may seem to be the very opposite of what I said a few minutes ago when stating 
that if seen as the last link in evolution, man loses his separate identity and is therefore cast out of the world order. But just because his identity remains unknown, he is seen to be nothing but part of nature. Instead of being elevated from the complexities of nature, he is merely added to them. He becomes a being embodying the causal nexus. Such an interpretation casts out the human being, and consequently education places man into a sphere devoid of humanity. It completely loses sight of man himself. People do not see this situation clearly because they lack the courage to do so. But we have reached a turning point in the evolution of the world, and we must summon up the courage to face fundamental facts. For in the end, our conceptions will determine the paths of our lives. We have been opposed by people who, in all good faith, are convinced that the ordinary scientific explanation of world evolution can be the only right one. They equate the origin of the world with the primeval nebula, which are comprehensible only through the laws of aeromechanics. They equate the end of the world with total heat destruction, resulting in the final world grave. Into this framework they place the human being who materializes from somewhere outside the human sphere and who is destined to find that all his moral aspirations, his religious impulses and all his other ideals are nothing but illusions. A mood of tragedy pervades such people. They are the ones who have to live consciously with what, for the majority of mankind, lies dormant in the subconscious. And this underlying mood has become the burden of our contemporary civilization. However, out of such a mood we cannot educate, because it excludes the kind of knowledge of the world from which knowledge of man can grow. It cannot sustain a knowledge of man in which he can find his true value and his true being, a knowledge of which he is indeed if he is to experience himself as a reality in the world. We can educate to satisfy the necessities of outer life, but such an education hinders man from becoming a free individuality. If, Nevertheless, we see children grow up into free personalities. This happens in spite of our education and not because of it. Today it is not enough merely to think about the world. Today we have to think about the world in such a way that our thinking becomes gradually transformed into a general feeling for the world because out of such feelings grow impulses for reform, for progress. It is the aim of anthroposophy to present a knowledge of the world which does not remain in the abstract, but which will enliven the entire being of man, thereby becoming the right basis for educational principles and methods. Today we can already see the consequences of the materialistic world conception as an historical fact. Through his materialistic interpretation of the world, man was cast out. And the echo of what has thus lived in the thoughts of educated people for a long time can now be heard in the slogans of millions upon millions of the proletariat. But the civilized world shuts its eyes to the direct connection which exists between its own world conception and the echo coming from the working classes. The mood of tragedy experienced by discerning people who have come to the conclusion that moral ideas and religious impulses are of an illusory nature and that humanity exists only between the earth's nebulous beginning and its ultimate destruction by heat, this same mood we meet again in the outlook on life of millions of workers. For the only reality in their philosophy consists of economic processes and problems. According to the proletarian conception of life, the only things that matter are economics, how they have been dealt with in past ages, how labor and production were managed, how buying and selling were organized, and how through this process of production the physical needs of the people were satisfied. 
On the other hand, any moral aspirations, any religious ideas or political ideals are looked upon as ideology of a fundamentally illusory character and are considered as an unrealistic superstructure imposed on the only reality in life, namely the process of material production. In this way, what has been a theoretical and at best a semi-religious conviction among some educated circles of society has, in proletarian circles, become the determining factor for all human activities. This is the situation which man is facing today. Under these conditions, he is trying to educate. But to do justice to such a task, he must free himself from any bias, and he needs to observe and grasp this present situation. It is a characteristic feature of intellectuality with its naturalistic world outlook that it alienates man from the realities of life. From this point of view, you only need to look at earlier conceptions regarding life. There you will find modes of thinking which could well be linked to life, thoughts which people of past ages would never have looked upon as mere ideologies. These people were rooted in life. And because of this, they never treated their thinking as if it were some kind of vapor rising up from the earth. Today, this latter attitude has already invaded the practical spheres of a large part of the educated world. And people are groaning under the consequences of what has come to pass. Yet mankind is not ready to recognize that what is happening in Russia today and what will spread into many other countries is the natural consequence of the kind of teaching given at universities and schools. In these institutions, one teaches, one educates, and while in one part of the earth people lack the courage to recognize the dire consequences of their teaching, in the other part these consequences are ruthlessly pushed through to their extremes. We shall not be able to stop this wheel from running away unless we penetrate to clarity, especially in this domain, unless we learn to place the laws of causality into their proper context. Then we shall realize that the human being is placed into a reality which will leave him no room for maneuvering as long as he tries to comprehend the world by means of the intellect only. We shall recognize that intellectuality as an instrument does not possess the power of taking hold of realities. I once knew a poet who already decades ago tried to picture how the human being would end up if he were to develop more and more in a one-sided intellectualistic way. Footnote, the poet's name is Hermann Rollett, R-O-L-L-E-T-T, lived from 1819 to 1904, and a footnote. In the district where he was living, a somewhat drastic idea of men of intellect, of the intellectuals, was prevalent, for such people were called big heads, in German Großkopfet. Metaphorically speaking, they were supposed to carry large heads on their shoulders. This poet took up the local expression, arguing that human development was becoming more and more intellect-centered and that consequently the human head would grow larger and larger, while the remaining parts of the body would gradually degenerate into some kind of rudimentary organs. He foresaw only rudimentary arms ending in tiny hands and rudimentary legs with tiny feet dangling from a disproportionately large head, until the moment would come when humans would move by rolling along like spheres. The day would come when one day read that again, the day would come when one would have to deal with large spheres from which arms and legs were hanging like rudimentary appendages. A very melancholic mood came over him when he tried to foresee the consequences of man's one-sidedly intellectual development. Looking objectively at the phenomenon of intellectuality, one can see that it alienates man from himself, that it removes him from reality. Consequently, an intellectual person will accept only the kind of reality which is recognized by the proletariat, the kind which cannot be denied because one hits against it, suffering many a bruise. 
in keeping with present educational systems, even the avowedly reformed ones. Such people believe that one can draw conclusions only within the causal complex. Alternatively, if they have to suffer from deprivation, again they limit their grasp of the situation to the laws of causality. When one is deprived of the necessities of life, one can feel, see, and experience only too well what is real. But one is no longer able to penetrate into real causes. While thus distancing himself from reality, man becomes less and less differentiated. Metaphorically speaking, he is really turning into such a rolling sphere. It will become necessary for us to gain an insight into how in our universities, colleges and schools we are cultivating the very things which we abhor when meeting them in actual life, as is the case today already to a high degree. People express criticism of what they witness, but little do they realize that they themselves have sown the seeds of what they criticize. The people of the West look at Russia and are appalled at what is going on there, but they do not realize that their Western teachers have sown the seeds of these events. As said already, intellectuality is not the instrument with which one can reach reality, and for this reason one cannot educate by its means. But if this is so, the important question arises. Can we make any positive use of the intellect in education at all? This poignant question challenges us right at the beginning of our lecture cycle. We must use means other than those offered by intellectuality, and the best way of doing this is to look at a particular problem in such a way that it is seen as part of a totality. In what activities does modern society excel, and and what has become a familiar pastime? Well, in public meetings. Instead of quietly familiarizing oneself with the real nature of problems, one prefers to attend conferences or meetings to thrash them out there, because intellectuality feels at home in such an environment. Often it is not the real nature of a problem which is discussed, for this, so it seems, has already been dealt with, but discussions are held for their own sake. Such a phenomenon is a typical byproduct of intellectuality, which leads us away from the realities of a given situation. And so one cannot help feeling that fundamentally such meetings or conferences are pervaded by an atmosphere of illusion hovering above the realities of life, while down below At ground level, all sorts of things are happening. Clever discourses are held about them in multifarious public conferences. I am not trying to criticize or to run down efforts made at such meetings. On the contrary, I find that brilliant arguments are often put forth on such occasions. Usually the arguments are so convincingly built up that one cannot help agreeing with two or even three speakers who in actual fact represent totally opposing views. From a certain point of view, one can agree with everything that is said. Why? Because it is all permeated by intellectuality, which is incapable of providing realistic solutions. Therefore, contemporary life might just as well be allowed to take its own course without the many meetings called together to deal with its problems. Life could well do without all these conferences and debates, even though one is able to enjoy and admire the ingenuity displayed at such meetings. During the last fifty to sixty years, it was possible to follow most impressive theoretical arguments in the most varied fields of life. At the same time, when quietly observing life without prejudice, one could also notice that daily affairs moved in the opposite direction from that indicated by these often brilliant discussions. To give an actual example, when some time ago in various countries questions regarding the gold standard were discussed, most ingenious speeches were made recommending its usage. One can really say, I do not at all feel cynical about it, but am sincerely earnest, that in various parliaments, chambers of commerce, etc., 
most erudite speeches were made about the positive results the gold standard would bring. Discriminating and intelligent experts, also those of real practical experience, proved that if we accept the gold standard we should also have free trade. But the latter was the consequence of the f- that the latter free trade was the consequence of the former. But lo and behold, in most countries which adopted the gold standard, quite unbearable customs tariffs were introduced, which means that instead of allowing trade to flow freely, it was shackled. The opposite of what intellect bred cleverness had predicted was the answer that life was giving. One must be clear about the fact that intellectuality is something quite alien to reality, that it makes the human being into a, quote, big head, close quote. Hence, it can never be the basis of a science of teaching, for it leads away from the understanding of man. Since teaching involves a relation between human beings, namely the relation between teacher and pupil, it it must be based on human nature. This can only be done out of a real knowledge of human nature. It is the aim of anthroposophy to give such a knowledge of man. The end of Lecture 2